Next, Monitor invites you to Meet the Press, America's press conference of the air and winner of every major award in its field. Our guest today is Secretary of State Dean Rusk. We'll bring you today's program in a moment after this message. This is Morgan Beatty recalling one of the big stories of August 1921. Berlin. The U.S. signs peace treaty with Germany, officially ending the state of war. World War I, of course. Now, 40 years later, another peace treaty with Germany is again the crux of international news. History seemingly repeats itself. Only this time, you are kept informed of developments as they happen throughout the day on NBC Radio News on the Hour. The convenience of modern portable radio makes it easy for you to stay better informed not only on the present Berlin crisis, but also on fast-breaking stories anywhere in the world. And NBC's concise, meaningful coverage reaches all America. So during the summer, keep up to date, wherever you are, by dialing Radio NBC. Ladies, when young children are around the kitchen while you're preparing a meal, be especially careful to keep your cooking pot handles turned in, away from the stove edge. Keep youngsters out of the kitchen, if possible, by giving them a game or a job to occupy their attention elsewhere. If you must have a toddler in the kitchen, put him in a high chair or a playpen. The National Safety Council says pot handles and children should be kept strictly apart whenever meals are being made. And now, Meet the Press. Today's guest on Meet the Press is Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Our panel consists of E.W. Kenworthy, New York Times... Peter Lissagor, Chicago Daily News, John Hightower, Associated Press, and Pauline Frederick, NBC News. Lawrence E. Spivak will moderate. Dean Rusk, who is our guest today, was president of the Rockefeller Foundation when President Kennedy asked him to become Secretary of State. Before that, he served the government for many years in the Pentagon and the State Department. In both places, he won a reputation as an effective troubleshooter. When he left the government in 1952, President Truman said, few men still so young had been able to serve their country so long and so ably, always with tact, skill and efficiency, with wisdom and patience. And now, Mr. Secretary, we'll begin the questioning with Ms. Frederick. Mr. Secretary, Vice President Johnson told the West Berlin Parliament last night, and I quote, To the survival and to the creative future of this city, Berlin, we Americans have pledged in effect what our ancestors pledged in forming the United States, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Was the Vice President speaking for himself or speaking for the United States when he said that? He was speaking for the United States and with a clear approval of the president. This problem in Berlin is not just a question of certain legal rights in Berlin, nor is it uh, just the presence of the Western allies, nor indeed just the freedom and security of the people of West Berlin itself, nor indeed the commitments of the NATO alliance. This issue is a problem of the great worldwide confrontation between the Sino-Soviet bloc and the free world. And it is of great importance that we make our commitments clear. Well, now, Mr. Secretary, we have been trying for some weeks to impress upon Mr. Khrushchev the fact that there will there is a point beyond which we will not go without fighting. Could you please make it clear to us about what we will fight? Well, this is a problem which uh, involves vital interests of the United States and of the West. And one of the problems of diplomacy, one of the functions of diplomacy, is to protect these vital interests without a war. But those vital interests are the presence of the West in West Berlin, the freedom and security of that city, its ability to live, its physical access with the rest of the world. Uh, These are at the heart of the problem, and these are matters which Mr. Khrushchev must take fully into account. In other words, we will fight if there is any interference with access to West Berlin. Well, I think at this point, uh, Ms. Frederick, it is better for us to concentrate on the vital interests and say that we want to protect those vital interests by peaceful means if possible.
but we will not be pushed out of West Berlin. Uh, Mr. Secretary, can the Berlin or the German question be solved by any war, limited or nuclear? There is no uh, prospect that uh, war will be the uh, preferable, the beneficial, the real answer to any question in the modern world. But on the other hand, it neither is surrender. So we hope that we can find a basis for protecting these vital interests by peaceful means. Will the Western allies have some definite proposal to make as far as protecting these interests is concerned without war? Well, over the years, the uh, West has had a series of proposals to make about Berlin. Uh, those uh, have been repeatedly put forward. They have been rejected by the other side. We do expect that negotiations will take place on this matter. Uh, just when and where will be determined by consultation among governments, including the government of the Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, negotiations uh, will occur. Mr. Lissagor. Mr. Secretary, it's been said that one of our chief assets in the whole Berlin crisis is the morale and confidence of the people of West Berlin. Now, sealing the border couldn't have been a surprise. Why did it take us three days to lodge a protest and a week to take countermeasures when the morale of the West Berliners seemed badly affected in the interim? Well, this, uh, the, the closing of the um, borders occurred, as you recall, last Sunday. And by the middle of the day, I had made a statement on the subject uh, with the approval of the president. On Tuesday, the commandants, the three Allied commandants in West Berlin had filed their protest. On Thursday, the um, three Allied governments had filed their protest in Moscow. And on Friday, the orders for the movement of the troops uh, was put in. Uh, this is not slow timing from the point of view of the situation in Berlin or the uh, necessity for Allied unity in dealing with a situation of this sort. Well, it is quite true that when the events occurred that there was dismay and revulsion among the people of West Berlin. And the events of the last two days have greatly reassured people. But, when the, but the, I think the principal point of nervousness came uh, out of the uh, presence across that, through that barbed wire, across those walls, of large numbers of East German forces uh, who had not been there before put into East Berlin, and rumors about uh, movements of Soviet troops around the city. And when it became uh, apparent that uh, these were having some effect on uh, West Berlin, I think the steps taken to reassure them had been fully effective. Well, as a show of the flag, Mr. Secretary, couldn't Vice President Johnson, for example, have gone to West Berlin Monday or Tuesday after the closing of the border? And wouldn't that have spared us the uh, spectacle of the West Berliners seeming to lose heart in the situation? I think it's possible, but the, it was important to know what the situation was, exactly what measures were being taken and which were not, what the effect of it was, and what wise Allied action would be. I'd like to broaden the question for just In other words, this is a matter of such importance that um, precipitate action or instantaneous action may not be the wise course. Uh, may I broaden the question for just a moment? Is it uh, a part of the character of a democratic coalition or alliance that you, you always have slow reflexes in a situation like this, and it takes you time to react? Well, it is true that the uh, need to consult among governments does take a certain amount of time. It means transfer of cables. It means consulting with, uh, with important leaders. But nevertheless, that can be done speedily on the basis of previously agreed policies, and that was the situation uh, here. I dare say that, Mr., uh, that the Soviet government, uh, in replying to the uh, Allied protest in uh, two days' time, uh, did not have the problem of consulting with allies. Mr. Hightower. Mr. Secretary, this... Uh past week's developments in, West, in East Berlin is usually treated as uh, rather an incident in a broad pattern and not one of the major incidents. However, I wonder if it is not true that what has now happened in Berlin, including the sealing off of the border, has had an effect on the, on the longer range issues which are supposed to come to a head later this year. Well, what has essentially happened in East Berlin uh, has been that the East German authorities and the Soviet authorities have blockaded the people uh, in East Germany and East Berlin. These fences are not put up to keep people from coming into East Germany or East Berlin. They're, 
they're put up to keep people from coming out. Uh, the, uh, the immediate cause, I think, for the blockade was the uh, increasing rush of refugees demonstrating the election of people in East Germany and East Berlin between uh, two patterns of life. The uh, failure of the communist regime in East Germany and in East Berlin provoked increasing uh, migration uh, out of that territory. And this created a crisis within, this, within the communist bloc. This put pressures on Mr. Khrushchev, which he found very strong. And he, in turn, translated these into pressures against the West. Now, the breakdown of the quadripartite control of Germany, the disposition of Germany and of the city of Berlin, has been gradual. It started with the walkout of the Soviet Union from the Allied Control Council in 1948. In 1954, uh, the um, uh, East Germans began to call themselves a sovereign state with Soviet blessing. The uh, city of East Berlin became the capital of the uh, so-called German Democratic Republic. Uh, this has been a part of a pattern uh, of Soviet action wherever there has been a um, physical control of a situation and regardless of wartime agreements. For example, uh, when they walked out of the Allied Control Council in 1948, this was parallel with their refusal to unify Korea, uh, roughly in time. So it's a problem here of, uh, of, of uh, the uh, failure by the Soviets to live up to their wartime and immediate post-war agreements in areas in which, over which they had physical control. Mr. Yes, Hightower. They have, uh, however, brought about a de facto situation, a condition on the ground in the division of the city and in the cutoff of the refugees, which is one of the things they have talked about in this Berlin problem all along. And uh, the, the specific question I'd like to pose is, is it conceivable that, that the broader Berlin issues might now be, be more easy to negotiate as a result of the developments there, however deplorable they may be? Well, that depends, of course, on the negotiations themselves. The uh, three Allied powers uh, have not, as our protest indicated, abandoned any claims which they might have to the quadripartite treatment of Berlin. Mr. Khrushchev, on the, on the other hand, is inclined to say East Berlin is not negotiable. It's the capital of East Germany. But these are questions which will come up in the negotiations. I noticed in their reply to the most recent reply to our protest that uh, reference was made to the fact that these measures are temporary. Well, we don't know yet what that means. We suspect that it means that uh, they uh, hope to incorporate them in some permanent arrangement. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this will be a subject of, of conversation and negotiations. Mr. Secretary, in, in view of what has happened to East Berlin, does the West still consider that uh, West Berlin a four, is a four-power city in which the Russians still have rights? Well, the disposition of the entire city of Berlin uh, is a matter which ought to be a matter for quadripartite agreement. That is a separate enclave inside the territory of the Soviet zone of occupation. It is not a part of that zone, nor is it a part of the German Democratic Republic. Uh, we uh, uh, suppose that in any arrangement for all Berlin that the quadripartite um, discussion would have to take place. But we cannot accept a quadripartite disposition of just of West Berlin on the general notion that, uh, that that is separate from the total problem of Berlin and East Germany. Mr. Kenworthy. Well, Mr. Secretary, we seem not to have got very far in our efforts to try to impress upon the neutral nations that they have a vital moral and political stake in self-determination, which is the essential issue uh, in West Berlin. Uh, Mr. Bowles and Mr. S Stevenson both reported uh, indifference to our case amongst the neutral nations. How do we plan to, uh, to try to impress upon them that they do have a stake uh, here? Do we plan to take it to the United Nations in order to elicit their support? I believe that the neutral nations are responsive to the notion of self-determination. They do look upon this immediate problem in Berlin as a question uh, primarily among the great powers, and uh, they would, I suppose, hope that negotiation would find some settlement for it. 
But I think when the issue becomes completely clarified in the course of negotiations or in the further development of the crisis, that the uh, so-called neutral nations uh, will make it clear that this principle of self-determination, which is so important to them in their own parts of the world, is one to which they attach importance uh, right around the world. I, I don't, I'm not myself discouraged about, about their attitude on this question. Do you think it would be useful to take the issue to the United Nations, Mr. Secretary? Well, it may be that uh, at some stage this will come before the United Nations, and if the crisis becomes very deep, uh, it would almost certainly be there. But if it were to go to the United Nations at the moment, uh, the United Nations would probably, in view of the past practice of the United Nations and the uh, expectations of Article 33 in the, of the Charter, the United Nations probably call upon those directly concerned to attempt to settle the matter by negotiation. That is in, pro that is in, in prospect, and therefore uh, I would not suppose that it need be referred there at the, at the moment. Well, Mr. Secretary, n now that the sealing of the uh, border in Berlin has presented us, presented the West with an accomplished fact, what remains to negotiate except uh, uh, getting out of Berlin? Well, I don't suppose that we, uh, uh, well, I'm quite sure that we should not assume that the only thing to negotiate is what Mr. Khrushchev has proposed. One of the problems in uh, dealing with the Soviet Union has been that uh, they tend to uh, draw into their own basket all of the things which they can pick up and say, now, these are not negotiable. And he has made some proposals about West Berlin which are not acceptable. Now, there's no reason why we cannot insist upon proposals and put forward proposals that go beyond his proposals as far as Berlin and Germany are concerned. After all, the principle of self-determination does apply in this situation. And uh, he uh, must take into account the uh, long-range needs of a peaceful and permanent settlement there in Central Europe. So uh, the, uh, the specific proposals which Mr. Khrushchev has made with respect to West Berlin are not the only subject of conversation. Mr. Hightower. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to clear up a couple of specific points about today's developments. In the first place, do you think that the Johnson mission and the assignment of troops have have been uh, uh, successful in their major purpose of reassuring the West Berliners? From all reports, there is no doubt that um, both of these steps have been well received and did give the reassurance that was talked about. Indeed, uh, those steps were not really necessary in terms of the total commitment uh, of the West to that situation. But nevertheless, it was a tangible representation of the commitment. Do you see any significance in the fact, Mr. Secretary, that that so far as we know, the communists made no effort whatever to interfere with the movement of this battle group along the Audubon. Uh, no, we did not uh, expect uh, that interference. Uh, there was no question about the right of this group to move there. Uh, the blockade, so far as we're able to tell, has been directed against the East Germans and not against the West or access to West Berlin or indeed to the West Berliners themselves. So that uh, this, I would say, is a, is a normal transaction. I've got one other sort of clean-up question for the day's news. You referred to something you didn't really understand in the Soviet note which came in yesterday. And I've heard it said that we don't really know what Mr. Khrushchev means when he talks about giving guarantees or assurances of access rights. Can you uh, say now whether you think perhaps the time has come for some quiet diplomatic exploration to find out by contact with these people uh, what it is they do intend about Berlin and whether, whether there may be an area of negotiation? Well, there are a number of points that will need clarification in one way or another. Mr. Khrushchev, for example, has said that uh, the question of the unification of Germany is an internal matter for the Germans. He's talked about guarantees of access, but that is related to his free city proposal. Uh, presumably. He has talked about, uh, in their recent reply, they talked about this uh, blockade as being temporary in character. There will be an exploration of points of that sort. Exactly how and when, uh, I'm not prepared to discuss today, but uh, there are many channels open and, <clears throat> and available uh, so that uh, these points can be taken up. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you've spoken out in the past pretty strongly against summit meetings. Do you think that this is going to have to be resolved at a summit meeting? I would think that if questions of this sort could be, are to be handled at a summit meeting, and I now uh, fully agree with the position taken by the President on this matter, 
There should be full preparation so that a summit meeting can be successful and not, uh, not a failure. Uh, these are matters which have to be explored well in advance of any meeting of heads of government. Miss Frederick. Mr. Secretary, you've said that the Russians in the past have turned down proposals the, United, the Western powers have made for trying to solve the German question and the Berlin question. Uh, is the West now prepared to offer any new ideas, any new program that might receive a warmer interest from the Soviet Union? Well, if um, uh, the Soviet Union stands pat and offers once again proposals that is made before and keeps saying that this or that or the other proposal is not negotiable, then uh, the question comes, do you keep offering a whole range or succession of new proposals in the hope that eventually they will buy. Now, the general policy and attitude of the West on these problems is well known. There's no, uh, no great difficulty about uh, knowing how the West would like to see these questions settled. But there, in the details of negotiation, there would be uh, certainly consultation among the governments and details worked out. For a perfectly obvious reason, it's not possible to talk about the details of such proposals before they're made. Uh, Mr. Secretary, isn't it possible that the, uh, the West uh, Berliners and the West Germans, having been reassured now by the visit of the Vice President, will become disillusioned again quickly if there isn't a follow-up of some kind, whether it's an initiative in diplomacy or whether it's an effort to try to prevent Khrushchev from signing a peace treaty with the East Germans. How are you going to prevent this disillusionment? Are we ready to take the follow-up step? Well, there will be follow-up steps um, in diplomacy, but uh, no, I shouldn't be uh, specific on questions that are being discussed among governments about the timing and shape and scope of negotiations or steps of that sort. Uh, but um, uh, this is uh, a matter which is at the top of the minds of the heads of government and the foreign ministers of the uh, Western governments, and it will not be uh, handled through inadvertence or neglect. It's giving a great deal of thought and attention. Mr. Lissagor. Mr. Secretary, the East Germans now control the bulk of the traffic into West Berlin, <clears throat> the civilian traffic. Should they begin delaying that or stopping it, uh, would we consider that a violation of Western rights in West Berlin? Well, the Western rights in Berlin include access to the city. Now, it is true that about 95% of the actual traffic into West Berlin is civilian traffic, and that is handled through arrangements between the West Germans and the East Germans. But nevertheless, that civilian traffic is vital to the life of the city and is a part of the Western rights in West Berlin, so that interference with physical access to the city would be a very serious matter indeed. So uh, we, uh, they could virtually cripple West Berlin if they stopped all this civilian traffic and did not interfere with our allied traffic, that is, the military part of this traffic. Could they well, there's not? Well, no, there's no real distinction between military and civilian traffic in that sense. You remember back in 1948, the, in 49, the, uh, uh, the, the blockade was on both, but the, uh, military, the civilian supply of the city is a part of the responsibility of the powers who are responsible for West Berlin. But it is a fact, is it not, that the Russians take care of uh, the uh, military part of this traffic and the East Germans oversee the uh, civilian part of it? As far as personnel at the checkpoint is concerned, that's correct, yes. Mr. Kenworthy. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if I may get away from Berlin for a moment. Uh, last week, the President urged the members of Congress to uh, apply the bipartisan principle in foreign aid, which he said was so necessary in this crucial hour. Now, the House and Senate Republican leadership both last week offered to support a long-range development loan program providing the president would not insist on Treasury borrowing. Could not the administration really achieve its long-term objective without the borrowing principle? Well, this has been a matter on which the Congress has been working very hard for the last several weeks in hearings and in its committee work and in, now in debate. Uh, as you know, the Senate uh, has agreed with the President that uh, the long-term borrowing authority is an important part of an effective aid program. The House uh, did not agree. The vote was uh, quite close. Um, and this matter will go into conference during the next week. The uh, House, on the other hand, uh, sustained the financial aspects of the aid program uh, more strongly than did the Senate. Um, the President's proposal is that 
uh, as he sees it, that the most effective way to handle this uh, long-term uh, commitment authority is by way of long-term loan arrangements, or uh, borrowing arrangements. Uh, the, it'll be up to the conference and the Congress to work that out. Of course, if we had our choice, we'd take the long-term uh, uh, borrowing authority uh, approved by the Senate, the financial uh, um, levels approved by the House, and put them together. Couldn't you live, however, with just an authorization under which the president could make commitments with some assurance that Congress would actually appropriate the money annually? In terms to, uh, in, of getting the most effective aid program, we should like to live with the president's proposals. Mr. Hightower. Mr. Secretary, to go to still another problem, some officials of the Castro government in Cuba apparently have been telling uh, countries in Latin America, leaders of countries in Latin America, that Castro would like a reconciliation with the United States and would like to renew trade. Apparently, some of the cutoffs in trade are beginning to hurt a bit. Uh, do you see any basis for reconciliation, especially in view of the deal you made a week or so ago for a return of a plane for a ship? The um, essential problem in uh, our relations with Cuba is Cuba's uh, alignment with the Soviet Union and the Sino-Soviet bloc. Uh, we have had no indication that they are prepared to break this alignment or to join the uh, community of American states on, on the normal basis. We have, uh, through the uh, Swiss and Czech um, uh, governments, uh, tried to work out arrangements for handling ships and planes and vehicles of that sort in the interest of safety of travel. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm sorry to have to interrupt, but I see that our time is up. Thank you, Lawrence E. Spivak. We'll tell you about next week's guest on Meet the Press in just a moment. In November 1863, Lincoln delivered one of the immortal speeches of all time. Yet his two-minute dedication at Gettysburg was considered so insignificant that the next day most papers carried it on the inside pages. This is Bill Ryan reminding you that today you would not miss such an event, for NBC Radio covers all important presidential activity. The major Kennedy speeches, his complete news conferences, in addition to frequent daily reports direct from our White House correspondents. NBC News informs the nation. Americans are inclined to take a lot for granted, but to people in an underdeveloped country, a good road, plumbing, and good farming methods simply do not exist. These young nations need help which you can provide as a member of the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps needs people who know how to design and construct farm buildings, farm management experts to plan the best use for the soil, farm mechanics to explain the care and maintenance of tractors, people experienced in vocational agriculture to teach in schools, engineers to develop irrigation systems. The list goes on and on. Your skills can help. That's why the Peace Corps wants you to volunteer. And don't count yourself out because you don't have a college degree. With the Peace Corps, your 4-H club and future Farmers of America experience is just as important. For more information, write to Peace Corps, Washington 25, D.C. That's Peace Corps, Washington 25, D.C. Now, more details about Meet the Press. Our panel today consisted of E.W. Kenworthy, New York Times, Peter Lissagore, Chicago Daily News, John Hightower, Associated Press, and Pauline Frederick, NBC News. For a printed copy of today's Meet the Press discussion, Send 10 cents in coin and a stamped self-addressed envelope to Merkel Press. That's M-E-R-K-L-E, -E, Merkel Press, 809 Channing Street, Northeast Washington, D.C. Next week, Meet the Press will have as its guest the recently elected chairman of the Republican National Committee, William B. Miller, a member of Congress since 1950. Vacationing America stays better informed. Tune to NBC.